Hi, uh, welcome to people watching at home and uh, in the audience. Um, my name is Justin McDaniel. I'm a professor of religious studies, uh, Buddhist studies uh, and East Asian, South Asia studies and material culture at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'd like to welcome you uh, to today's um, talk uh, in the Center of East Asian Studies, the first talk of our fall uh, series. And I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I'm honored uh, um, to uh, launch the, the series this year, but also I'm honored because I'm introducing an old friend, uh, Dr. Michael Stern. Um, Dr. Stern and I have known each other uh, for about um, 20, actually exactly 20 years. I thought it was uh, so 2001 Fulbright Fellows together uh, in Thailand. And um, we uh, both did Southeast Asian studies, uh, largely uh, mainland Southeast study, studies. Uh, he was in political science at the University of Michigan, PhD. Um, and I was doing Sanskrit and Indian studies and, and Thai literature and Lao and Burmese literature. Um, and so we took very, very different paths, um, even though we were both studying uh, the same area of the world. And he also took a different path in terms of his career. Or I, I went into academia, uh, he went into foreign uh, and public service uh, with USAID. And today we were uh, really blessed that he gave us uh, a nice workshop on alternate careers for people in area studies, uh, PhDs in area studies and his work with USAID, not only in Southeast Asia, uh, but in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Madagascar, uh, Germany, and now is the head um, of uh, country representative of USAID in the country of Laos um, and uh, where he has been uh, for the past uh, year. Uh, today, he's giving a talk bilateral and multilateral foreign aid to less developed countries from the US and East Asian perspectives. Um, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Stern. All right, great. I know that we're in a uh, hybrid environment, so I just want to make absolutely sure that everyone can hear me. Uh, you're, everything's coming in clearly? Okay, wonderful. All right. Well, I do, uh, Justin, you know, Dr. McDaniel, <laughs> really want to thank you uh, for the invitation to come here. It's just a, an absolute pleasure to be here um, at, at UPenn um, and see the campus. I really don't know this campus at all, uh, but I've had a chance to explore it see part of it, meet some people, and uh, it's just, uh, I think it's just a fantastic place. Um, and also the East Asia Center and uh, various other, you know, staff here who have been really accommodating, welcoming uh, to me uh, to be able to come here and give this, uh, and give this talk. Um, I did want to sort of issue a little bit of a disclaimer before I start, and which is to say that um, I am here in a personal capacity. Uh, I am not here I work for the United States government. I work for the United States Agency for International Development, a federal government agency. But uh, what you're going to be hearing today is not federal government or you know USAID views. These are my own personal views, and I really just wanted to kind of you know make that clear so that there's no confusion about you know the things that I'm saying are coming only from me and not from sort of don't take them as federal government or USAID policy because. Uh, because they're not, or they may not be, okay? Uh, but thanks for that. So, but just, you know, very briefly, just, so my background, I've been with USAID now for, you know, uh, actually, I'm in my 15th year. Um, and prior to even the USAID, I had uh, a fair amount of experience in, in Thailand and other parts of Southeast Asia. Um, and so much of my career has been kind of on a sort of a, you know, kind of a practical side. Although I did get my doctorate from the University of Michigan, uh, that was way back in 2006. Uh, and as um, Dr. McDaniel pointed out, I decided to go a, um, a sort of non-academic career. So what I'm bringing to the kind of um, ex sort of talk today is much more of a kind of a practical experience. Uh, and so I just wanted to make sort of make that clear um, as I, you know, before I kind of move on. Um, and uh, just you know, quickly, I think for because we're in a hybrid kind of an environment right now, uh, and I actually, at least in front of me right now, I can't actually see the chat on Zoom. I can't actually see the questions. So I think probably the best thing to do will be I'll go through the you know the presentation um, and definitely leave time for questions at the end. 
uh, and I'll try and leave ample time so that we all have, you know, uh, you all have a chance, those of you who are here in the room, those of you who are online to actually ask questions and I'll do my best to give you the right kinds of answers. So just sort of presenting this topic, um, I mean, if you think about it in a very sort of kind of blunt way, you know, you, you can collaborate, uh, you know, directly with other people, other organizations, or you can make the choice to do it by yourself, right? This is a, a dilemma that, or a question that many of us face uh, is in our daily lives. Um, and, and if you look at the title of the presentation, think of collaboration as sort of a multilateral approach. And I'll get into a little bit more about what I mean by this definition of what is multilateral, but more or less, that's what I'm really talking about. Um, you know, multilateral really essentially means sort of, you know, working with others and in a sense, working as a team. Um, the bilateral approach is more the do it yourself. Okay? And when I say bilateral, that would mean, for example, uh, and I'll get onto this definition, but you know, this is sort of one country as a, you know, a sort of a donor country, you know, going to another country that's a kind of a recipient and, and, you know, and making some arrangement to provide some kind of a sort of foreign aid or foreign assistance, okay. Um, and so really what I'm trying to do in this presentation is sort of look at the, sort of look at these two approaches to foreign aid uh, and think a little bit about, you know, how effective they are relative to one another. Um, and, uh, and I am gonna draw on examples from the United States. I'll draw on examples from East Asian countries. Um, I will tell you uh, and be very honest about it. You know, I am, I'm not an East Asia person per se, right? Uh, I'm really more of a kind of a Southeast Asianist, but I can tell you for sure that, um, you know, the, the examples uh, from East, you know, East Asian countries, and in particular, I'm thinking uh, a lot about uh, sort of uh, China, Japan and, uh, and South Korea um, are actually quite, quite useful. Uh, and in particular, um, the, 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 the Chinese case actually is gonna get a bit more emphasis here today because it really is sort of the most interesting one and, and in some ways kind of the most relevant when you think about uh, you know, policy debates uh, and, uh, and kind of broader issues in, in international affairs right now. So, just to foreshadow my kind of overall point here, you know, what am I kind of, what's my argument, if you will? Um, I'm actually gonna make a case uh, with some caveats, but I'm gonna make a case that the multilateral approach is a more effective approach. I'm gonna make a case that the multilateral approach kind of gets you better results. Um, and I'm gonna base that quite a bit on my field experience. You know, these past 15 years, seeing bilateral kinds of you know aid projects and doing them myself doing things in a more kind of more multilateral environment more collaboration uh but i'm also going to be sort of referring back to uh and i have looked at you know there's a an ex fairly good and kind of extensive extensive literature actually on the effectiveness of foreign aid right you know this is not this is not some new topic that i'm you know kind of making up i mean this is something that people have studied quite a bit um, but I feel like I can bring a little bit different perspective to some of that literature because I've been out in the field. Uh, at the same time, um, any of you who spent a lot of any time with sort of foreign, foreign service officers like me know that we're really, really good at telling you all sorts of stories about these like wild roads that we went on and, you know, and all these crazy people we met and these weird situations we got into that's not what I'm going to do today. Okay. I'm not here to tell you anecdotes. I'm not here to tell you tales about the field. I'm going to try and really keep it on topic. There'll be a few moments, you know, where I kind of mentioned, you know, some, you know, personal experiences I had, but that those are really going to be kind of an exception. Uh, it's just so you're aware of what, you know, the approach I'm taking today. All right. And, and that last bullet point, you know, the multilateral approach, I do believe overall it's more effective. It gets better results, but you know, but it is it is hardly perfect. Yeah, it's got some it's got some definite pitfalls, and I'll talk a little bit about those as well. Okay, so just to get into a little bit more detail, so you understand, it's like, okay, what is when he says multilateralism? You know, what is he talking about? Okay, so essentially, you're talking about two organizations or two or more organizations, I should say in this case, providing foreign assistance and they're cooperating with one another and they're pursuing some sort of common goal, okay? Um, and they're doing it for a third country, right? 
So in multi multilateralism, just by definition involves at least, at least three players are kind of in the game, okay? at least. And oftentimes it, it can be more. Um, you know, so the United States could be giving money to the United Nations, uh, you know, to the World Bank to do some work in Thailand. Um, Japan and China could, you know, be jointly funding the Asia Development Bank to do some work in the Philippines or wherever it happens to be, okay? Um, that's often how these, you know, multilateralism works. But we also see some cases where um, you don't just take the money and kind of, you know, put it into a, one of these big organizations like the United Nations or the World Bank, but you actually sit down and you work, you know, these, these sort of donor governments like the United States or South Korea or Japan or China or whoever actually sometimes actually get together and sometimes jointly design things. Uh, they jointly fund them. They kind of pool their funds together. And that also is considered to be multilateral. So you can see that element of kind of collaboration here. You know, you're doing it kind of as a team, okay? And contrast that with bilateralism, where one country and one country is sort of a sort of a donor, a provider. Another country is a recipient. They form a partnership with one another. There's only two countries involved, um, and that's and that's you know how the the sort of the foreign aid is sort of managed and uh, and and provided with funding. Um, and there's uh, you know we see both approaches all over the world. Um, both approaches are, you know, are quite common, uh, and I've worked on both kinds of situations, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So foreign assistance, okay? Um, when I think when some people think of foreign assistance, there's a whole series of things that could you could imagine if you thought about it broadly as being foreign assistance, but there is actually a definition for these things, okay? Um, and that's uh, what they call official development assistance, and this is the... Um, uh, Organization of Economic Cooperation Development, the OECD, they've kind of developed this definition. Um, it's got to be from governments, right? It's not from some other source. Um, or it could come from multilateral institutions, meaning things like, you know, the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund and those. Um, it comes in some sort of form, typically as loans or grants. Um, and it's for some this specific purpose of this sort of economic development and the welfare of a of a, of a nation, a developing nation. That's its primary objective. So it's not remittances, right? It's not the money that people working abroad are sending home. It's not foreign direct investment. Um, so I'm working with a fairly kind of limited definition here. Okay. So anyway, just to kind of clarify just sort of what I'm talking about. So um, anytime I talk and give a presentation like this, I say, well, why should you care about this? What difference does it make? You know, he, you know, what's Dr. Stern up here, you know, talking about? Okay, so the first thing I would say is that we're talking about a fairly substantial amount of money. Okay, um, according to the official data, uh, you know, uh, official development assistance or foreign aid, as I've defined it, uh, it was seventy-six million dollars in two thousand nineteen, um, and that's almost half of the total ODA. And these again are our official figures. Um, and I put up a few other numbers there just so you can see a little bit about sort of, you know, some of the countries that I'm talking about kind of what they're, uh, when they look at sort of all the foreign aid they give, sort of how much of it is multilateral. Um, and you can see, you know, we've got America at 11%, Japan at 19 South Korea at 25 and then China, um, this is really an estimate. Um, China, and I'll talk a little bit about this more, um, is a little, they're, they're not part of this uh, uh, this sort of OECD kind of um, uh, group, and so they're not required to report their 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 sort of foreign aid numbers. And so a lot of what people are trying to do, there's been a lot of effort devoted to trying to figure out how much money does China actually give, right? Um, that's a whole other topic, um, which I will not. I I just don't have time to broach. Um, so $76 billion sounds like a whole lot of money. Uh, boy, if you look at sort of, you know, private funds and, uh, you know, sort of flows of capital abroad, it's not very much, actually. Um, but what makes it really important is, is that it's going into certain kinds of areas and certain kinds of projects and certain kinds of, you know, initiatives that, that you know, the private funding is generally not going to go into. Things with more of a kind of a public good aspect, right? So when you think about addressing climate change, 
um, when you think about you know, combating COVID-19, right? Of course, there are private funds that are going into these things as well, but there are certain things that, you know, the sort of private flows of capital are not going to be so interested in. And those are the areas where you find sort of development assistance coming in. Um, and, and you've got this, you know, major role of the United Nations and the multilateral financial institutions like the World Bank. Uh, and they're, you know, and they're powerful players uh, and they do have a fair amount of influence over many governments around the world. So these things do make a difference uh, to people's lives and to the policies. Um, and also, I just want to point out too, there's, there's been a kind of interest in sort of the talking about foreign aid and sort of how much is given, but also sort of how effective it is. Um, back in 2011 in Busan, that's in South Korea, um, there was a partnership developed uh, for you know this partnership for effective development cooperation, and actually the U.S., China, Japan, and South Korea all endorsed this you know the document that came out of it. Um, and so there is a kind of general international interest in saying, well, you know, all this money that you know governments, including U.S. taxpayers, are putting into this, is it really being effective? Is it really working? Okay. So that's in a sense kind of why I think this topic you know does matter. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of, uh, you know, sort of effectiveness um, in terms of the countries that receive the aid. And then actually going to, I'm going to spend most of my time on that and maybe talk a little bit also um, about, and this is a curious topic, actually the effectiveness or the benefits, if you will, to the countries that actually give the aid as well. Because it turns out that, uh, that some you know, sometimes when you work multilateral or work bilateral, you can actually look and see, well, I mean, there may be some, you know, some measures in there and some reasons why it's actually good for the, for the, com for the country or the government that's actually giving the funds to. Um, so, so some of these are measures that I, you know, there's a lot of different measures uh, for sure. And I just want to be clear about that too, for sort of how one measures the effectiveness of foreign aid. And this is really just kind of a, a subset of ones that I thought were you know, fairly important to focus on. If you go to the literature, you'll find uh, plenty more, um, but these are ones that I thought were useful to, to look at, but also uh, reflect my own experience, you know, practical experience on the ground as well. So one would be the contribution of internationally accepted development goals. Um, some of you may have heard of, you know, the United Nations, you know, the sustainable development goals. These are kind of like high level sort of international goals that um, countries are all sort of who do this kind of work are supposed to contribute towards. Um, and this is kind of one measure of, if you will, sort of effectiveness. Um, one of the, the catches with this though, uh, is that um, it's kind of difficult to, um, these things are a little bit difficult to, to measure. Um, and actually they're in particular, in my case, for purposes of my topic, um, there's not a lot of information. It's very difficult to sort of, uh, sort of determine the difference between, well, how much of it was due to multilateral and how much of it was due to bilateral, right? So there's, I'll talk a little bit about this, but there's some measurement issues and some data issues in here that, that, that make this a little bit difficult to discuss. Um, the next one is sort of transparency. Um, uh, I think it's, you know, it's, it's pretty important to talk about if sort of effectiveness or just transparency in terms of, well, you know, um, is multilateral aid more transparent or does it make it easier to see, you know, how much money is being spent? Where is it being spent? You know, what sectors, who's getting the money, right? Um, and then also too, how funding decisions are made. Yeah. So this is a big issue with trans, you know, sort of transparency. And we think about this as a, a sort of measure of just you know, how well or what are the benefits of doing things multilaterally versus bilaterally. And then a term that I'm sure many of you have kind of heard about if you've just studied this kind of area at all, which is the sustainability question, okay? And I'm taking sustainability in a fairly kind of straightforward way. Um, will the government or the local institutions in the country actually you know, take up the work and continue what was going on when the foreign aid stops, right? That's, that's essentially what I'm talking about with when I talk about sustainability, okay? So these are sort of uh, three areas that I'll sort of look at and I'll, and I'll bring, be bringing in some examples. Uh, and then again, I'll briefly talk about the effectiveness for the organizations providing the funds, okay? 
uh, it turns out that um, reputation can be kind of important uh, in this calculation. And also what I'm sometimes calling a seat at the table. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. But really what I mean here is, is that sometimes when countries or organizations sort of you know, give aid and give foreign aid, um, it, it sort of gives you some credibility and it allows you to um, you know, sort of uh, have more uh, entry or more engagement uh, with, you know, with the governments or with the other players in the countries where you give the aid. Uh, and that turns out to be, in some cases, a very, very useful thing. Okay. So I'm now going to kind of get into a little bit about, um, you know, talking a little bit about in a little more detail about effectiveness. I'm going to bring in some some experience that I've had with both, you know, U.S. aid uh, and also with, uh, you know, with particularly with China, particularly uh, just because I think it's just a really uh, fascinating case and and a very politically relevant one. Um, so when you talk about effectiveness, um, so my point here is is that when you work multilaterally, okay. It is a kind of negotiation, okay? and when you work multilaterally, you're bringing in a series, a, multi, a sort of a series of players, multiple players into the process. Those players, those entities that you bring into the process, they bring a lot to it. They bring expertise. They bring networks, you know, connections uh, with other organizations, um, and they also bring, and this is really important, international standards. Okay, and so. When you work with an organization and done this many times, you know, you're working with the United Nations and you're working with the World Bank. Yes, I understand that they're big bureaucracies and they have their inefficiencies. And yes, they're sometimes uh, vulnerable to a certain amount of political influence. I totally understand that. Those are the caveats. But you know what? They come with a certain set of standards and kind of operating procedures that they actually, in most cases, do follow. Uh, and that makes things, you know, I think it provides sort of much more kind of effectiveness to, to aid when you know, for example, that uh, when, a world, when the World Bank is going to be doing a project, that there's a review process for the project, right? Uh, and you know that when a project is going to be done and funded, that there's going to be a, you know, a process for evaluating the project when it's over to see what worked and what didn't work. Those kinds of standards are actually really, really important. And that's a really key, key part of why I'm sort of arguing for the effectiveness of doing things multilaterally. Yes, you can do that kind of stuff bilaterally, but when you do it multilaterally, it kind of puts more pressure on you to sort of you know, follow the standards, to do the evaluations, to do the reviews, to take into the, in account all these other factors. Um, so in the case of the United States, when I've seen work done kind of multilaterally, um, it's definitely fostered transparency. Uh, our, you know, the United States government, when it has been engaged multilaterally, um, we, we have been kind of pushed into doing a lot more with publishing a lot more numbers on where our aid is going, you know, how much by year, you know, by different sectors, you know, the, even down to the level of exactly which organizations have actually received the money. And you know what, before, that just wasn't really the case. Um, but the push, I think, to do things multilaterally has actually made US government and particularly USAID uh, work sort of you know, much, much more transparent. And that turns out to be really helpful because then it gives you a sense of, well, you know, now I know where the money's going. Oh, well, if the US government's putting money there, you know, maybe that we don't have to duplicate that effort, right? So there's some real advantages to that. Um, and in terms of sort of the kind of contributing to these, you know, these broader development goals that I mentioned. Um, so definitely the United States is doing that. However, um, we are beholden, at least in the US government, we're beholden to Congress uh, and we're beholden to, you know, to obviously to the White House as well as an agency. And that makes life really interesting because sometimes they want results on kind of a short-term basis. Uh, and the kinds of big, you know, overall international collaborative results I'm talking about, that's very, very high level stuff and it takes a while to get there. And so sometimes you can, uh, if, you're, if you have to report on results, you know, every year or every six months, it can sometimes take a little bit away from contributing to the very sort of higher level ones. 
Um, so thinking a little bit here, sort of turning my attention to China, okay. Um, transparency is definitely gonna be an issue uh, with China in terms of their um, aid. Much of it, you know, is, is not multilateral. It's not country level. Um, they, don't, they don't sort of participate. So, and here's where an anecdote comes in. So it's very, when I've been on the ground um, in many, many countries, there's a lot of coordination between the different donors, you know, the, the, you know, the various international aid donors, you know, like the, you know, the US and Britain and other European countries and Japan are all getting together and meeting with the UN and meeting with the World Bank. But uh, many times China is not in those meetings. They, they're, they're not participating. Okay. And what China's, what China tends to do uh, is they sort of, you know, say we sort of dispense with that and we just go straight to the government. That's a very, very common thing uh, for, for sort, of, sort of how they kind of administer aid. Um, and that causes problems because it creates problems with transparency, for sure. We don't know exactly what they're talking about. And members of the public don't know, what, you know what, what's, what's kind of happening either. And I'm not saying this to kind of you know, bash China because as I'm gonna show you in a minute, they've actually been doing things in, a, in some ways in a much more kind of multilateral way, which is a very, very uh, important development. Um, and I wanna also point out that you know, China is coming under pressure to do things in a more transparent manner. And my argument would be that that pressure is actually coming from China's engagement in multilateral forums, okay? So in the same way, I think in some ways that the United States came under a certain amount of, you know, of sort of pressure by working in a more kind of cooperative environment, I would, and I think the US is sort of further along in that, but I would actually argue that, that China um, uh, and sort of aid in general is sort of benefiting from that multilateral approach. Um, and it's, but there's some, again, there's some caveats in there because, um, you know, so to give you an example, um, China is sort of getting into this multilateral space, you know, kind of more and more. But the way they're doing it is very interesting. Um, partly they're doing it by, you know, they're giving contributions to, you know, Asian Development Bank and the other kind of big sort of standard multilateral, you know, financial institutions that have been doing this kind of work for decades now. But at the same time, they're also, China is forming new ones. They're establishing their, in a sense, kind of their own uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of counterbalance to the big, you know, well-established ones like uh, the World Bank and others. So you get things like um, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, right? Uh, and there've been various kind of studies done on this there. Um, China has very limited influence. If you look at the, you know, kind of the voting shares and, and the World Bank and, and these kinds of big multilateral financial institutions. So the way they've, and they've been, and it's been difficult for them to kind of break in and, and have more influence. So they've just, so their, their tactic is just to form new ones, to form new ones. Now, um, if you are a bit of a pessimist about this, you would say, oh, well, obviously the reason they're forming new ones is because they just want to control them, right? You know, these are not multilateral institutions. They're Chinese institutions. Yeah, that's all they are, okay? Um, I actually would argue that I think it's going to be a little bit more subtle than that. Um, and even if the Chinese government, you know, has a kind of a longer term plan to make those into basically Chinese institutions, and even if the Chinese government is providing most of the funding for them, the only way they can set those up is to do it collaboratively. And so they're cooperating with the Asian, in, you know, the Asian Development Bank. Uh, they're cooperating with the World Bank. They're cooperating with, with some of the other donors as well. And I actually believe based on you know, what I kind of see that this is starting to um, have a real kind of influence on China. And they're, they're picking up on the fact that, for example, you need international standards to do this kind of foreign aid work. Um, one area that China has been doing a lot is in so-called green finance. Um, it's kind of a new area for them. Uh, there's still some problems with it, uh, but it's very curious. They've actually developed some set of standards 
um, for how they do lending, you know, to make it sort of more green, more environmentally friendly. Um, and again, the pessimist in you might say, well, that's just all, you know, on the surface. And really they're just, all they're really trying to do is just get as many resources as they can for their country. But I really believe it's a little more subtle than that. And I think what you're going to see is that over time, their China is going to have to start playing more in the multilateral space, and they're going to have to compromise a bit, you know, as this as this goes on. Um, so that's kind of talking about China. Um, you know, Japan, they give a pretty substantial amount historically uh, for, you know, for for foreign aid, it's uh, sort of it, it typically runs at about 35% of what they do. So they're, they're very much engaged, you know, in this space already. Uh, and they also are a part of this, you know, this OECD. So all, you know, the Japanese aid numbers are provided to, you know, kind of a central database. They're all published. It's, it's actually quite transparent. Um, I think the South Korean case is actually kind of a neat one. They're a new donor on the, on kind of on the block. Uh, and, they're slowly building up a kind of a portfolio of programs. And I've had numerous meetings with the, with, the, with the South Koreans. And what they're doing is really kind of neat. What they're doing is they don't have, so USAID and, and others have, we have a lot of, we have embassies with like a lot of staff on the ground in a lot of different countries. You know, there's, there's, a, there's people out there to sort of do the work. Um, and we've got well-established mechanisms. You know, the South Koreans don't have that nearly as much. So what they're doing is, is they're building, but they're putting money in, right? They're putting billions of dollars in and they're building up this portfolio of programs and they come and they talk to us. So almost everything in a sense that, uh, so basically South Korea is taking a very multilateral kind of approach. They're very cooperative. They're really coordinating. Um, they ask a lot of questions about what's going on and what they're looking for is programs that they can sort of buy into, right? Because they can't, they don't have the resources in all, you know, the, the personnel and stuff to sort of set these things up themselves. So they look at their goals. They look at what, you know, what's USAID doing? What's the World Bank doing? What's, you know, whoever the, you know, what are the Japanese doing, whoever, and they sort of buy in to the programs, but they talk to you first. And I think that's actually really, um, you know, potentially, and again, I'm sort of making this argument for being multilateral, this is a pretty good start for the South Koreans, you know, to be taking it in this direction. And I think as results start to come out more for what the South Koreans are doing, I think you're going to find that they're, they're going to have some real successes because they're, they're collaborating in this way. Um, so getting into this question of sustainability, um, this is the biggest challenge in foreign aid by far, you know. What happens when you know the money's not there anymore? You know, you know when 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 USAID's project stops, when Japan's project stops. You know, who's going to take up that work? Um, my argument would be uh, that, uh, and think about. Um, I'm guessing here at UPenn that there's a certain amount of uh, work that has to happen in teams uh, for certain kinds of subjects, right? You know, you gotta. You know, you got to write, a, you know, a, a paper or do a project as a team. You got to design something as a team, and you know how difficult that is, right? You've seen that, okay? So, I'm saying, yeah, that's difficult in the world of foreign aid too. But from a sustainability standpoint, if you bring in different players, different sources of funding, different expertise, different connections with your host government, my argument is is that that actually promotes sustainability more than I think bilateral funding. Because once the bilateral funding is gone, it's, you know, it's one country providing the funds and then they end. And then, you know, if you're lucky, somebody there on the ground will sort of, you know, take the project forward and continue whatever it was. But more often than not, unfortunately, and it's, uh, it's just something we face sometimes that, you know, nobody picks it up. Um, but boy, if you've got multiple players in there, it can make a real difference. Um, and the other part of that too with sustainability is um, what I sometimes call comprehensiveness. If you want to do a project uh, in the foreign aid world, you just quickly discover that um, somebody says, okay, let's, let's build a school. Okay, something very simple. Well, you build a school, it's not just the school building, right? It's the 
teachers? Who's going to train them? Who's going to pay them? All right. Who's going to develop the curriculum materials for the students? Who's going to update that stuff? Who's going to train the teachers? Right. In some countries, you've got security concerns. Right. Uh, you know, who? How can you get to school safely? Is there transportation to get to school? Oh, well. But what if the kids have to come a really long way and they're very poor? Who's going to feed them lunch? How do you cook that? What do you feed them? Yeah. Oh, but they've got health issues. Well, what do we do about that? What if we've got kids coming to school who aren't vaccinated? Yeah. There's just a whole series of things that go on. My point being that you, when you build a school, there's a whole other set of things that are involved, you know, nutrition and, you know, could be issues with water and sanitation, issues with, you know, you know, with education or training. So you need a lot of players to come in and, and provide, you know, the different pieces of that puzzle to make that school a success. And what I'm saying is, is that when you take a multilateral approach, you bring in that expertise, you bring in more, you know, more members of the team. And if you work it right, if you set it up right, you've got all the sort of expertise and the resources there to, you know, to provide that school with what it needs. Okay. And again, that's why I'm arguing for the multilateral approach. That approach is much harder for a bilateral donor, right? Because you're just the one country and then you're trying to handle, you know, all these different sort of areas, okay? Um, so in terms of sort of the U.S., uh, we have been, um, we're, the U.S. actually, it's been interesting. So, you know, I think, you know, under the Trump administration, there was a bit of a pullback from doing things kind of multilaterally. Under the Biden administration, clearly there's been more of a, a, a sort of welcoming, you know, working collaboratively. Um, you know, we see this with, you know, the COVAX facility for, for the vaccines. We've made, a, we've made big contributions to that. But there's lots of other things that we made contributions to. Um, there's a, the Gavi, which is a global vaccine alliance, which is, um, also working on the on the COVID nineteen stuff, um, there's the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. A lot of these things are related to health. Um, all of these are fostering a very multi sectoral approach, and actually have had um, pretty good results. Right? It's a slow process. It's not easy, but we're starting to actually see. I mean, HIV numbers are going down internationally. TB numbers are going down internationally. Malaria numbers are going down internationally. And like I said, it's a slog um, and it takes a while to set up, but it works. Um, and um, now China's approach, at least when it does things in a kind of more bilateral and a bit of an opaque way, I would argue that that's not particularly sustainable, right? Um, because nobody in a sense is sort of, there. there's, and like, there's nobody to sort of hold the, the, you know, them accountable for some of the things that they do. Now, some of their projects are going to work quite well. Um, to give just a one example, um, so I'm in Laos right now. Um, the Chinese are on the verge, probably in December of this year, of opening up uh, what's essentially a high-speed railway that's going to run from the, the capital all the way up to the northern part of the country, and kind of, you know, and then actually take you up to to Kunming in southern China. Um, it is a, um, looking at this very objectively, it is an amazing project, okay? Uh, and it is probably going to generate a lot of just sort of economic activity. Um, it's going to make shipping goods a lot cheaper. Um, it's going to move, you know, it's going to increase tourism. So if you're looking, you know, if you, if you ask the question, is it sustainable? Someone might say, well, yeah, maybe it is, right? On the other hand, um, there's a lot of other projects they're doing which may be not so sustainable or maybe uh, you know, a little, or they would have some you know, environmental problems. They, uh, some of the energy work that you know, the China's doing, which, is, which has been quite opaque uh, over the years. Um, but again, I would argue that we're seeing as China moves more into a multilateral space, we're starting to see them getting into things like, um, uh, so when they contributed money to the COVAX facility, Right, uh, or not money, but they. I mean, their their vaccines are now, you know, sort of approved under you know under Covax. They basically more or less submitted their vaccines for COVID nineteen to international scrutiny. Okay, I know people have some questions about the Chinese vaccines. There's still some reputational issues there, um, but you know, but the fact that they were willing to you know you know sort of instead of just you know shipping them randomly off to various countries without any approval at all. 
but they were willing to sort of, you know, put them under kind of international scrutiny. I think that is a, a good sign. Um, again, we're still fairly early on in kind of where China is and sort of a kind of multilateral kind of view on things. Um, and I would also point out that, um, so it turns out actually that when China does foreign aid, um, their structures for doing that are actually very, very fragmented um, within the Chinese government itself. Uh, and that actually creates problems because sometimes, you know, sort of the right hand and the left hand within the Chinese government actually don't know what they're doing. So that makes it even more opaque and more difficult to understand, even for the Chinese. Um, but when you get into multilateral kind of cooperation, you know, you have to be more transparent, you have to, you know, participate in meetings, you have to provide information. And so that's going to kind of force them again, uh, you know, to, to act in a more kind of systematic manner, uh, because it's, that's just, you know, you, it's not possible to do it another way. Um, uh, and I just wanted to briefly comment on Japan in this case. So um, Japan has a, a habit that I've seen over a number of countries where, which is very nice, they, um, so they do a big project. Uh, and what they do is, is they, they provide sort of kind of peripheral projects on the outside of the big project, right? So you do, so that like, for example, in Madagascar or where I was, they built a big, they're building a big port, um, but they decided that there was a problem with kind of uh, corruption potentially in the, you know, in the, in the construction process for the port. So they actually developed like this whole side project just to sort of do accountability. And they were talking with us at USAID and they were talking with other donors and they were kind of collaborating to see what it was we were doing on this kind of stuff. So I think I would give a certain amount of credit to the Japanese for, you know, not just, they have, a, I mean, there's a historical reputation that Japan, you know, was always doing things in a very sort of self-interested way, but actually I think there's been more of a turn at least over the years towards more of a kind of multilateral approach. Uh, and I think that's actually been quite helpful uh, to the kind of effectiveness of what they do. Um, so moving on to, I'm getting near the end here. Uh, so we'll leave time for questions. Um, so there are some benefits for the countries that give the funding, right? You know, this is not just about the recipient countries when I talk about sustainability and all these things. Um, so the, the very brief ones, so the first thing is that, that um, when you give money multilaterally, I actually believe uh, that I've seen this pretty clearly that um, it builds better relations with your, with your, the governments that you're, you know, that you're working with, whether it's in Laos or Madagascar, or, you know, or, you know, you know, Colombia or wherever it happens to be. Um, you know, governments kind of, you know, like the fact that there's, organizations that you know money is being channeled through that they kind of work with that they understand that publish information about you know what they're doing they're transparent uh, and that kind of thing now with my organization with uicid there's a little bit of a catch in this because um we oftentimes don't give money directly to governments and many other donors actually do uh and so so um when governments see USAID doing something, for example, through the United Nations, that makes them kind of happy because what, we, what happens is we give the money to the UN and the UN sort of channels it into the government and the government says, oh, this is great, right? So it sort of builds up a certain amount of goodwill. Uh, and that's as opposed to doing it through say, uh, you know, like some kind of contractor or a consultancy, uh, an organization like, you know, Save the Children or something along those lines, okay. Um, and there's a, probably a fair amount of suspicion, I think is, is pretty clear with China, you know, kind of what are their motives uh, for, you know, for all these, these aid projects that they have. Um, and multilateralism for them probably is, is gonna build trust as well. Uh, it's, I mean, I think we've already seen sort of signs of that um, a little bit, maybe with COVID-19, although they still tend to give vaccines somewhat bilaterally. Um, and I think China, if they really want to do this right, they're really going to have to start participating in the in the in the kind of country level donor coordination forums. That's that's been a huge gap for them, right? I mean, if they're not if they're not there talking, exchanging information, networking, sitting at the table, it's very very difficult to sort of talk about well, you know, how are we going to work with you and prevent duplicating our projects and, uh, and knowing where your funding is going. So maybe we can develop things that complement what you're doing, right? You know, if you don't know what's going on with building this wonderful railway in Laos, 
uh, then you know how are you going to mitigate the effects of it? For example, you know environmental effects or other kind of economic displacement that happens. Um, and then the last one would be sort of the seat at the table question, which is uh, sort of multilateral institutions um, like the World Bank. They're pretty influential. Uh, when you work with them, it kind of gives you a little inroad into places where they have some influence as well. Uh, if we give money to the World Bank, it helps us and Chinese would be the same. Um, or places where people have a certain amount of lack of trust in American motives or Chinese motives or Japanese motives for that, for that matter. Um, when you channel your money through a multilateral, which is kind of well known, um, it helps you kind of, uh, sometimes we've actually seen cases where uh, we've actually gotten meetings uh, and been able to engage with government officials just because they knew that we were you know, doing things in a more kind of collaborative and cooperative manner. All right. But that was just briefly. So I'm, this is my last slide, just some really concluding thoughts. So I'm sort of making a statement that multilateralism is a story about the benefits of teamwork, okay? Uh, and you can sort of, you know, read on the slideshow here kind of, you know, what it is that I've, uh, you know, what sort of the sort of the benefits would be in that case. But the point being here, it's not easy to do. So I guess what I'm saying is you're taking the harder road at the beginning with multilateralism, but in the end, the results you get are better. It's just harder to set it up. It's harder to establish it. It's harder to do. And I think we're going to see, uh, especially with the with our Chinese friends, that this is what this is something that they're going to be encountering more and more. Um, I definitely think there's a role for sort of the scholarship on aid effectiveness to kind of look into this issue, uh, you know, a bit more. Um, I think the Chinese case could be a really interesting one to, you know, to do some work on. Uh, and there's been some work on that already. You know, the question of kind of sustainability is also one that, you know, maybe hasn't gotten so much attention. Um, and the last point I would make is, uh, so all of this fits, you know, this is just my one little piece that I've talked about. All this fits into a broader debate about, you know, uh, this changing balance of global power, which I'm sure some of you I've studied, you know, quite a bit in some of your classes. So a question that you might ask is, well, um, if, you know, if, if you're, if you think that there's a reason to sort of blunt Chinese power, if that's the position you take is, you know, is sort of, sort of pushing the Chinese to work more multilaterally. Is that a way to kind of help do that? Um, now that's a pretty small part, right? Cause there's a whole military aspect that I haven't even touched and I will not touch in this presentation. Um, but you know, it's sort of, you might sort of think about ways that you want to engage with China, right? Um, and who's going to engage with them? And what should the United States be doing in this case? And should we be, you know, reaching out to partners like a South Korea or Japan or others, you know, to be doing this kind of engagement and working more multilaterally and seeing if we can get some benefits out of it. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, and I'm sorry, I probably went on for a little bit long, um, but I did want to leave some time for questions. And I don't know exactly how much time we have total for the uh, I think we started a little bit late or, okay. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. And I'm ready to take questions from here in the room or online. Yes, here in the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the question is, is uh, does China have um, sort of problems or difficulties um, with multilateralism in terms of international negotiations? Um, I can't, honestly, I can't, I can't comment on that too much because I, it's to be very honest with you, it's not a topic I know very well, just because I'm not, you know, that's, that's more my state department colleagues that work on that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, I can tell you that, um, uh, China has clearly been, you know, engaging more in these kind of international forums. I mean, that, that is very clear. From, you know, from everything that I see and, and my own experience on the ground. And so I would, I would argue that in some cases, you know, they're kind of, you know, winning some of those negotiations and winning those battles, depending on kind of, you know, who's in the room. And in other cases, they're not, right? Um, in other cases, there's going to be uh, a fair amount of there's just, there are just too many sort of other powerful players in the room that even, uh, you know, a country as powerful as China is simply just going to have to 
pull back. And that's just sort of related to what I was saying about multilateralism, right? Um, you know, there, there is room to influence what China's doing. Uh, even if you take the pessimistic view that they're sort of, you know, the, you know, they're just a bull out there and they're all, they're completely self-interested. Um, but, you know, there's still ways to push back on them, whether it's the multilateral forums or the international negotiations. So yeah, they're gonna have problems, um, but let's see how those play out. You want to use it? We've got another question from the room. And uh, I don't know if there are any, are there any questions online too? That's so. Okay, so let's go ahead here. So um, my question basically is, uh, so for a few days ago, we saw the president of the EU announced sort of this initiative where they're trying to form their own aid organization, sort of as a response to China's BRI in Europe, for example, but goes past that, of course. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering what your, with your experience in like aid and how these countries have behaved in the past, what do you think the direction is sort of kind of going to be on that? And um, if you see it more as a bilateral EU, um, other countries organization or working through the US, for example, as they have been in the past? Yeah, this is really going to be, I, yeah, this is, I mean, with respect to the topic I just talked about, this is something really to watch, right? Because in a sense, uh, um, instead of, Instead of trying to, you know, the EU and by doing something like this, instead of trying to work through the existing institutions, they've sort of formed another one, which is sort of what the Chinese are doing, right? Right. And so I'm a little unclear about how this is going to play out. Uh, I think this is a, to me, this is a little bit of a mystery. Um, there are, there are resources that China can put towards this kind of, you know, work, particularly on infrastructure that I think other countries just don't have right now, uh, and that includes the EU, uh, and that includes the United, you know, the United States. Um, you know, they they have levels of, of of debt in some of those countries that we and economic problems that I think China is not experiencing. Um, and so I'm not really clear how well that kind of an effort is going to be able to sort of compete, if you will, if if that's the goal with China or. Or rather, or maybe really what they're trying to do is it's just kind of a little bit of a power play to sort of send a signal to China and say, okay, guys, you know, we know what you're doing. We just want to know that, you know, we're reacting to this and we're aware of what's going on. Uh, and really it's a, it's a way to sort of pull China to the table to talk, and then they're going to work something out. Uh, um, if you take kind of a longer term view on things, that would be my kind of, if I had to make an interpretation, that's actually what I would say. Um, it's less about direct competition with China. I think it's actually more about getting them to, you know, sort of come in and, and do things in a less bilateral manner uh, and talk more and collaborate more. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, uh, thank you for coming to talk to us today, Dr. Stewart. Uh, my question is, so these recipient countries, um, is there any scenario in which the, they have to choose between uh, rivals, for example, like the US or China? And like, uh, is there, like, what role does their agency have? They're caught in any like geopolitical rivalry, we're talking about balance of power or anything like that. Uh, what, uh, what kind of like implications uh, do their choices have, um, like accepting certain projects or not? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. There's, I mean, there are quite a few implications for some countries because, the, um, for certain countries, the aid that's coming in, uh, you know, and, and again, particularly from China and also Japan, uh, and to, and maybe to a little bit lesser extent, the United States, it's going to be pretty significant, you know, in, in the context of their economies. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example here just to kind of put this in a little more detail. So, um, you know, countries do sometimes have to make choices. Right, uh, and those choices. Um, uh, I mean, it depends a little bit. So, but what I think. So, let me one sort of indirect way to kind of answer your question is: is um, it oftentimes turns out that that different sort of donor governments and countries sort of specialize in sort of certain areas. Um, so there may be actually a little bit less competition than you might think uh, in this kind of space. Um, Right now, the United States government is, is, is not doing much infrastructure at all, actually. 
Um, we used to, we used to do a lot. Uh, boy, if you look back historically, you know, uh, particularly at a place like Thailand, I mean, there's a lot of roads that were built there, you know, over the years and in other countries as well, but we're not doing that so much now. Um, we're very big in, for example, health, right? That's a big area for us. And, uh, and, and you know, and obviously the COVID-19 response globally too. Um, China, less so on the health side, much more on the infrastructure side and much more on the energy side in particular too. Um, Japan, however, is big on infrastructure as well. They just tend to be very kind of very selective about exactly what projects they do. So, um, but um, I do think countries have to, I mean, they do have to make some choices here, right? Uh, and, and in particular, the choice they have to make is sort of, you know, who's, who's offering kind of the, you know, the, the best deal. And, but there's a corruption element to this, of course, right? And you, know, you can't avoid that part of it. Um, uh, Japan may come in with a better quality project uh, to do something, let's say road construction, whatever it is. Uh, and, um, but the terms, but they come in with more mechanisms to hold you know, the, the government accountable. And they come in with a, maybe not quite as concessional terms for a loan, for example, okay? China may come in uh, and do things in a you know, more opaque manner and offer a kind of more concessional terms. And so the government may just say, well, you know, uh, you know government officials may go for, you know, the sort of the immediate reward, right? You know, it's like, oh, we, you know, we just, you know, they're not looking, they're not looking at a kind of a long-term basis. So you can get situations like that for sure. Um, but I actually honestly think that there, there's not a lot of, how do I say this? There's not a lot of competition in the foreign aid world, honestly. Um, I mean, there's competition for reputation, right? You know, who's doing, you know, you know the most good, but not in terms of, uh, not so much in terms of, well, you know, we have a stark choice between, you know, just the Chinese project or just the American project. I actually don't see that very much. It's very curious. Um, but reputationally, uh, there's a lot going on. Yeah. Um, okay, I have the mic. So if I, if you wouldn't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll ask one. Sure. Um, so I, I love the discussion about multilateralism, and you know, I'm completely, completely um, convinced that that's, you know, you're, you're making an important argument that it may, it may be a, sort of a stiff, stiff. Kind of learning curve or, or launching curve, but the, the the ultimate product is is worth worth the effort. Uh, the part about your discussion that I found sort of curious is just how you place China and uh, particularly, well, not necessarily exclusively, but there was the Trump administration, and mm -hmm. you did mention, of course, that in the Trump administration we were. I mean, I thought it quite quite stark that during the Trump administration, it was Xi Jinping at Davos. Basically talking about free trade and WTO and all, you know, using the American language. Okay, mm -hmm. um, but more specifically, I'm sort of interested in in your discussion about the AIIB, which, if if I remember, the, the Asian Infrastructure Investment uh, Bank, if I remember correctly, at the beginning, you know, there's a big fanfare when it was when it came on in the first place, a big fanfare in particular because China invited everyone and anyone to join mm -hmm. basically everyone and everyone joined except the united states and japan and so i guess that, that doesn't quite sync with you know it, it, in this circumstance it seems to me china is the one that is promoting the multilateralism the united states is the one that is that's definitely not and i guess i guess the question if there is one is well what's that all about um what does that say about america's commitment to uh, multilateralism, or, or maybe it's simply that there's something about the AIIB that doesn't quite, I mean, you sort of alluded to it, doesn't quite qualify as a legitimate ODA opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, uh, you, you put me in a tough position. And this, this is exactly why I put out that disclaimer at the beginning, you know, to say that, you know, whatever I say in the room here is definitely not sort of, you know, sort of official US government policy on these things. Um, I mean, my interpretation of this right now is, is that, uh, um, you know, the, so the US sort of wants to play, you know, collaboratively kind of when they can. Uh, um, and I think, but, you know, particularly under this, you know, this new administration, they've clearly, you know, moved, 
in a different direction than the Trump administration, whether you agree with that or not is another, is another question. Um, but there's, there's a certain, I think there's, they, they feel like they need to sort of hold the line. You know, there's certain, uh, almost, as a, almost as a kind of, maybe even also, almost as a kind of negotiating tactic, right? So, you know, make the case for, you know, for doing things multilaterally, make the case for collaboration, you know, use the rhetoric, you know, that we see coming out of the White House, um, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, but, but it's, you know, but at some point they say, well, okay, that's fine, but, but we've got all these great multilateral institutions already, you know, why are, you know, you and the, why are the Chinese, you know, creating a whole new one? We don't need that, you know, that's just a, you're, you're just, you're complicating matters. You're sucking money out of institutions that are already doing good collaborative work, right? That would be maybe a US government position on these kinds of things. Um, and then, but the Chinese might come back and say, well, but the reason we're creating it is because you Americans and various other, you know, members of the OECD are not letting us in. We're coming at things with a huge amount of capital, uh, and you know we're a we're a growing you know kind of nation and power, uh, but you're closing the door to us. So you're the ones who are not collaborating, right? Because you're not letting us into these institutions um, that you know have been around for many many decades and have these you know fairly well established procedures. Yeah, uh, and that's and this is that moment where sort of. You know all that nice stuff I said about you know international standards and kind of working together. But believe me, there's always a political element, you know, to what the World Bank is doing uh, and what the Asian Development Bank is doing and the kind of the more well-established institutions like that. Uh, and there's conversations happening, and this is where things get opaque actually in multilateral institutions. There's conversations happening about you know picking the leaders for these kinds of organizations, uh, developing, you know, sort of you know, where funding is gonna go that we, you know, that you may not necessarily have access to, and maybe that's what the Chinese are reacting to. But I understand your point very well. It's maybe a little, one might, the Chinese might actually say, well, geez, the Americans are being hypocritical, right? Mm -hmm. You talk collaboration, but you don't let us in. Yeah. And I would just add that there is a history of that. This is not just a, a, a current uh, event. If you, my understanding, you know, I'm not a, I'm a, I'm a pre-war historian of Japan, so I don't mm -hmm. know that much about post-45, but my understanding of how the Japanese ultimately became such a powerhouse ODA country is in part because their or original effort to get the Americans involved in a uh, Asia-Pacific Marshall Plan failed miserably because the Americans said, no, I'm sorry, we're not interested. Uh, and so the Japanese joined the Colombo plan that, you know, created by the British Commonwealth towards Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. That became the sort of launching point of Japan's own fair, fairly aggressive move into Southeast Asia. And it was, it was fabulous for them. Americans in this case looked like, well, what the heck are you guys up to? You don't really seem to be the promoters of, uh, of multilateral uh, sort of, of uh, economic development in, in Asia. So again, I guess it depends on the time and there's a, there's a history there. Yeah, you know, and, and I think Japan is, uh, um, you know, they're, I mean, in a, in a sort of a, with looking at this with a sort of long-term horizon, I mean, they've, I think they've had some real success, uh, you know, in, in, in some of the work uh, that they've done because they've taken a kind of multilateral approach. You know, they, they tried, I mean, you just made the point, you know, they reached, you know, they, they wanted to do something in a, in a kind of collaborative way. They couldn't do it with the Americans, but they found another, you know, kind of avenue to do that. And, um, and I think you can see, you know, how that's built up the relationship between, you know, Japan and many other countries in Southeast Asia, you know, so again, playing that kind of long game. Um, and the Chinese are very good at that as well. Uh, playing that kind of a very sort of long time horizon, and how they, you know, they, they develop their policies and think about these issues. And, um, and I think that may be a bit of a problem with the United States. Uh, in some of our government policies, we don't always look 10 years or 20 years down the road uh, because the politics that we're facing, at least especially now, are so kind of immediate, right? Uh, we're not necessarily thinking kind of strategically uh, about some of these issues. Yeah. David, do we have someone on? No. Uh, anyone else uh, in house here? No. Yes. yes.
Um, so another question I had that's sort of also very recent is obviously what everyone's talking about right now is Afghanistan, but more related to this talk, obviously, is how um, most of uh, both the aid resources to Afghanistan and the sort of government funds that Afghanistan had abroad have been frozen. So right now, the whole country is kind of stuck with no money coming in that was sort of supporting the whole economy. So sort of my question is, um, obviously, we see things start to open up a little bit with are at the moment trying to get sort of more of an established position for the Taliban government. And I was wondering what sort of would need to happen or what are the steps that need to go into effect first for aid to start trickling in again and the economy to start back off in Afghanistan because obviously the Taliban aren't going anywhere. Whew. Okay, that's a, that's a different kind of question. Um, I mean, I did spend a year in Afghanistan, so I have some, you know, understanding of, of kind of, you know, what's going on there and sort of how, how foreign aid works in Afghanistan. So, all right, how do I answer that? What, so the basic question is, you know, what is it going to be kind of required to get a flow of, you know, of foreign aid, you know, to release these funds that are kind of on hold right now, kind of get that moving back into Afghanistan? Um, uh, well, I mean, obviously the, you know, the Taliban uh, have a, a serious credibility problem, right? Um, and uh, they're making some apparent motions to try and you know improve their reputation, but uh, uh, they've got a very, very you know big hill to climb up before they could you know convince people. Because again, you know, foreign aid does come a lot. I mean, at least the you know the majority of the aid does come with a certain set of standards, right? You can't. Uh, you know the you know the United States and and many of the you know the J Japanese and others are not going to give the money unless they feel like there's certain you know the ability to account for where the aid goes uh, to ensure that um, uh, you know that it's going to the recipients that it's actually intended for. All right, uh, if the Taliban can't ensure that, that's going to be very hard. And one of the problems I think with Afghanistan right now is is that so all those people that were working for all these aid agencies, all the, your, your, I mean, a lot of your educated class has left, right? So who's gonna, where's the sort of, you know, the, the administrators and the sort of people who know how this stuff kind of works on the ground. Um, I'm telling you, it's gonna be really, really difficult to kind of restore, uh, a, you know, any kind of significant flow of aid the one exception to that might be, and this is something we see very commonly, is, is sort of emergency kind of aid. When you're in a situation where people are just simply going hungry and they're like, I mean, they're going to die, um, that becomes a kind of an exception to the sort of normal rules, and and aid will oftentimes flow in. Uh, we see that with you know places like Yemen, you know Syria, right? Uh, you know, not countries where we're going to develop, you know, extensive health and education programs. But you know what, if people are starving, you know, there's a moral imperative that you've got to do something. So that may be the first flow of aid that you see going to Afghanistan. But again, we'll kind of see how that goes. That's a, that's an open question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm not quite sure what questions have been asked or what you talked about, but okay. Hi, um, I actually have a question about your thoughts on the relationship between aid and public reaction. I think it's a very huge part in terms of what con what country supports what. Um, I guess in terms of why Japan supports like South Asia, there's probably like a public reaction element to it, or why the US would support um Middle East. East countries, that, what are your thoughts on like it, the relationship between aid and public uh, sentiments, I guess? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, USAID has um, just, you know, historically, at least in the past, actually wasn't really very good at, at kind of um, telling the story about, you know, the, so a lot of the work that we were doing, for example. Um, I think there were certain other um, 
organizations or donors or whatever that were actually, you know, develop very good ways of, you know, in a sense, you know, I mean, you know, it's part of this is marketing, right? I mean, you just have to face that fact. Um, and there is, a, there are a lot of good stories to tell, right? USAID is definitely, at least, you know, just speaking personally, has gotten a lot better at that. Uh, and actually, actually my office, I actually, at least in Laos, I actually supervise the person who's in charge of all our media and communications work. And I work with him really closely. And we, you know, we're doing a lot to sort of, you know, look at that issue of, you know, sort of, you know, what do people know about what USAID is doing? You know, what's our reputation? How do people kind of see us? You know, uh, do they understand what we're doing? Um, and, but, you know, but the, the, the Japanese are very, very good at that as well. Uh, and what we're seeing a lot more actually is that the Chinese are, really, are getting into this, you know, this kind of um, work as well. Uh, they will, um, but it's very interesting what the Chinese do because they, they, the Chinese oftentimes focus on the, on the government. Um, and so, so for example, when I was in Madagascar, um, the, I went to the Ch Chinese, the Chinese embassies, they did their national day. Um, and, and the highlight of the national day was when they got, I think it was 13 different, you know, government ministers kind of on the stage with the Chinese ambassador to Madagascar, because that was a show of like, look, you know, it, you know, what kind of influence we have. Okay. Uh, and the Americans, uh, we couldn't match that. I think we got four um, <laughs> when we did ours. So um, a lot of, you know, interest in that issue of sort of, you know, reputation and, and you know, putting a good face on, on the things you do. And I think, um, and in some ways, you know, I was commenting on that earlier question we got about, you know, is there sort of competition, you know, for aid projects and how do governments make those decisions? Um, I would say actually in some ways the competition is, is more pronounced in, you know, sort of the media and the rhetoric that comes out more than actually sort of where the dollars kind of actually go, if that makes any sense. Um, I don't know if I've kind of answered, you know, your question, um, but it is, it's a, it's a really actually an important part of kind of what, you know, USAID does, but what lots of other organizations do. There's, uh, the Japanese put out some great, great promotional materials for, uh, for their stuff as well. And I think you're going to start to see the South Koreans uh, kind of upping their game in that area as well as they develop uh, develop more in their, their aid work. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, any, anyone else? I, I do have a slight follow-up to that. I mean, both, I know China and Japan every year have their sort of aid conferences where they bring uh, representatives of African countries, right? Oh, yes. Okay. What do you think about that? Is that is that an example of bilateral, not to be not to be a promoted type of ODA, which is just for show, or is it something else? And, and do, we don't do that, right? And, and we don't do it because we don't approve that kind of. Well, we don't. What's been interesting is uh, I I think I'm forgetting the the details on this, but I I think actually like for example, I think the Biden administration is about to call sort of a. It's kind of a climate change summit. Uh, it's coming up pretty soon. Um, so there, you know, so the, the United States definitely is not, you know, uh, you know, immune to, you know, to doing this kind of thing. Um, but I think the, uh, the Chinese do it in a more kind of overt, you know, sort of way. Um, is it bilateral or is it kind of more multilateral? Um, I'd say probably it's, it's sort of primarily kind of bilateral. And I think probably from the Chinese perspective, it's mostly bilateral. But there is a sort of a multilateral element to it as well. Uh, and what you sometimes see with the, when they bring in, so, you know, the, the African government representatives that go to China um, are not all just there, you know, for a handout of money, right? These people are smart. They've seen, you know, what China and other donors kind of have to offer. And when they go in, they, they go in with their eyes wide open. Uh, to these kinds of forums. Um, and I think partly, you know, they're looking for certain kinds of resources, of course, but I think also partly they're sort of asking the question, well, okay, but, you know, is, you know, is China following, you know, kind of more international standards? Um, is, you know, is this just between us and China or, you know, are there other, 
you know, is China willing to bring in, you know, other players, uh, you know, into these kinds of negotiations about what they're going to do with their aid. So um, I think as this, I think what, again, what you're probably going to see as this develops, that it'll start to take on a bit more of a multilateral flavor, but that's going to, but again, that's going to take time. Um, right now, I would have to say that it's primarily uh, a bilateral exercise in reality. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to Dr. Stern. You can give him a little round of uh, applause. And, uh, thank you for those watching on uh, Zoom um, and uh, great questions. And going to generate a lot of, I have a lot of questions myself, but I decided not to take the time <laughs> away from others. Um, and so thank you very much and have a great night. Thank you, everyone, for those here and online.